Well, I greet you from a hotel room where I am with Charlie when we came to get power and internet access to record my sermon. And uh, my heart goes out to all of you, all of us who, who are uh, betwixt and between waiting for power to come on. Bless all of you who have who've got it back already. Newspapers have all been reporting the stories of Tropical Storm Isaias ravaging our region, sending trees smashing into our cars and houses, blocking our streets with fallen wires, and the hundreds of utility workers and the National Guard struggling for days to restore power to more than two million people from southern New Jersey to northern Connecticut. I've read about small business and restaurant owners who have spent the last few months retrofitting their properties with outdoor seating or new ventilation, only to have it all carried away or, cru or crushed by the storm. A final blow to many in their long struggle just to stay afloat. And the hardships feel monumental far beyond the economic realm. One elderly woman who lost power and like many of you had already been homebound by the pandemic since March, told the New York Times, this is the worst year to my 82 years after the high winds shot a tree through her dining room window. Some of us not only have no power, but also no running water. And if like me, you've grown used to stocking up on groceries in order to be out less often during the pandemic in stores, now your food is spoiled in your warmed refrigerator. Isaias, they say, is rivaled only by Hurricane Sandy in the degree of devastation it has left behind. If we haven't been building our resilience this year, it is not for lack of opportunity. One New Jersey resident told a reporter, I wish 2020 would not have even shown its face. It's been one hellacious year for all of us, he said. The church around the world has faced some existential questions of its own in the last five months. We're so disconnected from our usual sense of structure and all the practices that set us apart. I hardly need to rehearse all the things we aren't doing anymore, from sharing bread and drinking from the common cup, like Jesus commanded us to do, and the weekly group singing and passing the peace with hugs and handshakes. What are we to become, many churches are asking, when our buildings are locked up and we can't come within six feet of one another? At least we have our live streaming capability, we've been saying among our staff with a reassuring sighs. But then this storm threatened to rip even that out from under us. The challenges coming one after the other they, as they have this year are beginning to feel like waves of the sea when you just can't get out from under them. In the gospel I just read from Matthew, the disciples spend the whole night at sea, in this case, the Sea of Galilee, struggling against strong winds and battered by waves. Jesus had just finished feeding 5,000 people on the hillside when he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him so he could go up the mountain by himself to pray. Even the man Jesus needs to refill his emotional tank in communion with the divine, whose presence he embodies, mediates, and shares everywhere he goes. Nothing is written carelessly in these powerfully concise gospels. Battered by the waves is an image that Matthew's community could relate to. The Matthean early church was familiar with being battered by hardship. They no doubt had many occasions on which their lives felt like the stormy seas of chaos and darkness. As Jewish converts, many, many probably fractured some relationships among their friends and families to follow their conscience to join the Jesus movement. Their city, Jerusalem, had been laid desolate and their temple had been destroyed. Every sense of order in their lives had been upended. But Jesus had promised to be with them even to the end of the ages. So from the storm-tossed boat on the Sea of Galilee, the disciples see the ghost-like figure walking towards them in the darkness, in the darkest hour before dawn. Jesus says, it is I, do not be afraid. Expressing doubt enough for all of the disciples, Peter says to Jesus, if it is you, let me walk to you on the water. In Matthew, the last time we hear someone putting Jesus to the test to prove his identity, it's the voice of Satan in the wilderness taunting Jesus. 
There the tempter says, If you are the Son of God, Jesus, turn these stones into bread. But Jesus answers with wisdom and strength, not with show. Out of his place of fear, Peter is looking for a miracle from Jesus. He wants some experiential, spectacular proof that Jesus is really there. Jesus grants Peter a one-word permission to leave the boat. Come, he says. But Peter initiated this exchange, but he was motivated by a lack of faith and wanting to put Jesus to the test when Jesus had already given him everything he needed to know. Jesus came proclaiming the good news message that the kingdom of heaven is near. It is so near, it is, near, it is within you. Early on, Jesus sends out his disciples in pairs and sometimes alone to heal and cast out demons. He empowers them again and again to draw upon the indwelling presence of God who's with them at all times. We are misguided to think that if only Peter had more faith, he could have walked on water. The disciple finds out quickly that the waves of life's challenges are nearly impossible to overcome when he steps out of the boat when he leaves the community, as it were, and ventures into the sea of chaos looking for a miracle. It is quite possible that when Jesus points out Peter's little faith, he might not be referring to Peter sinking into the waves. Instead, Jesus might mean that if Peter had had enough faith to stay in the boat and ride out the storm, he would discover that Jesus would be there and see all of them through it. That is the much more challenging place to be right where we are. In 2020, the year some wish had never shown its face, but it's the only year we have, right here in the woof and warp of our daily lives that are bound by biology and the laws of nature. We are misguided to read this gospel as a lesson in Peter's failure to walk on water because he didn't have enough faith. That would be like saying we could overcome all of our problems in spectacular ways if only we had enough faith. Adversity does not discriminate. Life involves suffering, and suffering touches everyone. If it's not a pandemic or a power outage, it's an acrimonious divorce or a tragic loss or infertility or mental illness or bullying or discrimination or economic disaster or the inevitable aging process, there's something for everyone. And hardship is simply part of what it means to be alive and human in this world. Faith involves handling our sufferings with our eyes wide open, accepting that these things can and do happen to anyone. Faith involves not asking, why me? But having the courage to accept, why not me? And looking for ways to live fully with courage and resilience, and most of all with trust in the power and presence of God to be with us in the midst of all comfort and all chaos. As New Hampshire's former Bishop Gene Robinson told a reporter once in the midst of his own life's firestorm, sometimes God calms the storm and sometimes the storm continues to rage and God calms me. Matthew's gospel warns against a brand of faith that looks for miraculous solutions to our life's problems. Because when we go there, so often this way of thinking just makes us feel guilty for not having enough faith. This is not the faith that God asks of us. As one commentator writes, faith is not being able to walk on water. Only God can do that. But daring to believe in the face of all the evidence that God is with us in the boat and made real to us in the community of faith as it makes its way through the storm battered by the waves. When we stay in the boat, when we stick together, when two or three are gathered, there is Jesus in the midst of them. Everything we do ritually and sacramentally is nothing more and nothing less than a reminder that the divine presence of God is with us. To lose our familiar practices and sacraments in the throes of chaos is not equal to losing the presence of Jesus himself in the midst of that chaos. Lo, I am with you always unto the ages of ages, Jesus promises at the end of Matthew. Our faith calls us to stay the course, stay in the boat, stay close to one another, trusting that God is ever with us in the midst of our wave-tossed lives and will either calm the storm 
or calm us in the midst of the storm. Amen.